Aloha, and welcome to Figments, the Power of Imagination. I'm your host, Dan Fig. Yes, people really call me that, Leaf. And uh, this is a show that's intended to entertain and inspire. Today, I think we're going to do both, but especially inspire. I'm already getting chicken skin, as we say in Hawaii, thinking about it, um, because it's going to be a good and important episode with a new friend that I made through the same reunion that I talked about two weeks ago on my prior show. And my guest today, as we talk about truly loving one's enemy, is Guy Reuters. Welcome, Guy, and aloha. Guy, uh, let me remind you, you know this kind of how I how we connected. I went to the reunion and saw uh, former Lieutenant Trish York, who is now a retired colonel, which makes me old. Um, and through her, I met her, her mom's friend, C.B. Long, and then he insisted that I talk to you. We talked and we ha- thought we had something in common. And, and in fact, we do have something in common. And that's that uh, we both have an interest in uh, Ford Air Control. And I fact in two airplanes and and darn proud of both of them. Well, I shouldn't be proud of them. I've flown the OB-10 and the F-16, uh, and a little bit of combat in the F-16. Uh, and uh, what I learned was you had been a Ford Air Controller, too, and we were going to talk about that, right, guy? That was the idea. Yep. That's good. So um, then, then we met, and we talked, met via Zoom and talked about your extraordinary life. I I have to say, if we took our two resumes up through age 22, yours would be the polar opposite of mine. You did pretty well in school and life, right? Fair, fair. Yeah, we, we, the main thing is uh, still alive, you know, like my daughter says, I'm alive, you know, so. Pretty but you were an Eagle Scout. You were a top student at the Air Force Academy. The Air Force Academy wouldn't even let me through the gate to sell pizza if you did that thing. But you did. You were very successful. No denying. I had good education. Very lucky. You know, got into the uh, Air Force as a in pilot training and so on. And, you know, did did, did pretty good there. Had a uh, I, I was very, very lucky to get into the pilot training because out of the academy, I got into what they call the Purdue program, which was right. a, a, a seven month master's degree, which led me right into pilot training so I could go to uh, Vietnam without having to go through four or five years of an engineering assignment in the um, military. So in other words, because of your, let me see if I've got this right, guy. Because of your excellence in your engineering studies, you were the top engineering grad in your class. Um, you were almost deemed too smart to be a pilot. If I if I got that right, no, no, that's not <laughs> right. But if you if you, uh, they had a Purdue program which they called the astronaut program, which let wow. you go to get a master's degree out of the academy in, seven in a months. seven month accelerated program mm-hmm. at Purdue, which. They actually came and taught us some of their courses uh, in our senior year at the academy. So then you could give, have a master's degree and then go right to pilot training and right to combat if you chose. And then uh, that would that would give you very early on in your career a master's degree in engineering. This was astronautical engineering, mm-hmm. which was space flight. And then right. you had a um, pilot training and hopefully some uh, experience in fighter units. So then that would put you in a fast track for the astronaut program. That's the kind of things they were looking for is fighter experience and uh, good education in engineering. And because of this Purdue program, they were going to get us a master's degree before we went to pilot training. So you did that. You went to pilot training. And while those plans are uh, all contingent on the needs of the Air Force, you did well enough in pilot training to wind up in single seat F-100 um class training in the hun as it, it's known uh and right. so that you know like i said it, it's performance based but then that's where the journey really took a transition and um you know here's here's a picture of you as a cadet and as a uh and then as a young f100 lieutenant pilot and uh, you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and whatever. You look like a, a young gun. You were a young gun. 
but life was going to take a transition very quickly that I, I wonder if you anticipated because you didn't go to combat in that fighter initially. You went to combat in the O-1 bird dog, which is as unlike the F-100 as anything I can imagine. I, I flew the O-1 a few times with the Koreans and there you can see it's a light single engine plane. Later is the to the right is the F-100 two seat Ford air control. You flew that too, but um, how did you wind up in the F-100 or in the O-1 in combat out of F-100 school? I've, I've read that that happened. Needs the Air Force. We need a Ford air controller. Here's your job. Well, they they uh, out of the I did very good in F-100 gunnery training at Luke, and uh, they assigned me to a F-100 unit. They would not let us go to Vietnam in fighters. They wanted us to have oh. a couple of years of operation so that we didn't dive bomb into the ground. You remember how that went? You could easily yeah, do that as a young fighter pilot. So I volunteered for Vietnam only out of gunnery school. I said, I don't care about, you know, staying in a fighter unit. I want to get to Vietnam. So they told me uh, that the only way I could get to Vietnam was to take an old one assignment, which they're looking for uh, F-100 or not, you know, fighter pilots, fighter pilots U.S. Air Force right. fighter pilots. Right. And they, they, they needed them for the U.S. Army, the U.S. Army, they wanted to give only fighter pilots to the forward air control job with the U.S. Army so that they understood fighters and they didn't get friendly forces killed. So I said, that's fine. I'll I'll take that. So we're, we're going uh, to talk. About, yeah. And guy, we're going to talk more about the forward air control mission is what you're doing. And it's important. That's that's the glue between the Air Force and the land force, the Air Force in the right. general sense. We've both done that. We understand its importance, and we're going to devote a whole episode towards it. But what in the heck made you so eager to get to Vietnam and get shot at? Well, I felt that? like it was my job to get. I was a uh, Air Force pilot, and it was my job to get to the fight. Basically, right. I, my dad was my dad had enlisted in World War II in 1940. He was an engineer with New York Telephone. He enlisted in 1940 when he saw the war coming and he was in the whole war, uh, you know, 40 wow. through 45. And he ended up on Eisenhower's staff for the last year. OK. And, and basically as a lieutenant colonel, you know, but basically the idea is, is that he said, if there's a fight, you want to get in the fight, you know, and so on. So basically there was a fight and, uh, you know, my dad was still alive and I just it, it just was a natural thing for me. We used to watch the Korean War, you know, every day when I was growing right. up and so on. Mm -hmm. And I'd had a lot. I'd read over a thousand books on warfare. So it was a natural thing for me to want to get into the war. Well, well we, yeah, we've found another kind of bipolar element of our comparison of our lives that converge a bit uh, in that my grandfather uh, was a Marine Corporal, just missed combat, got to Europe. But after the war was over, my father was commissioned right after the end of the war in the Navy. And I had a different obligation, but the same desire that I need. You know, somebody in the family had to pay the bill, pay the debt. Um, okay. Interesting. So you went, you flew the O one in combat, that light airplane, over four hundred missions. Yes, um, that's right. Not <laughs> an unarmed aircraft, basically. You had rockets to mark targets and probably got shot at a lot because the enemy knew how valuable you were. Um, Took a lot of hits in the aircraft. How did, did you? And see, this is all discovery learning. We're going to keep, we're going to do 12 or 18 episodes. I don't know, guy, but um, took a lot of hits uh, in probably in desperate circumstances where the land forces needed your help right now. And you finished your 400 missions. Could you have gone home then? No, after 400 missions. No, I could. Okay. I could not have. I could not have. But I volunteered for. Uh, I volunteered. I was. I'd been over there uh, at that time seven months or so. I volunteered for Misty's. You know, I wanted to get back into 100 at some point. I volunteered for yeah, Misty's. 100, yeah. Uh, in uh, yeah, to get back into fighters. And uh, somebody told me one of the fighter pilots that I kept in touch with told me about the Misty mission and it sounded really wonderful. And so I volunteered for him and was able to get in to the Misty unit. And for our viewers, Misty was a commando saber, I think was the name of the program. 
Um, sure. It was a special program, pretty classified, only volunteers, all fighter pilots flying two CDF 100s to look in what was known as Route Package 1, the southern area of the Ho Chi Minh Trail right near the demilitarized zone. <laughs> Full of guns, folks, very heavily defended. So he went from the frying pan to the fire uh, in terms of combat training. They were all volunteers. Um, it's a very unique and distinguished group. There are two former chiefs of staff of the Air Force that came out of the Misties and other names that as a fighter pilot I, I look at with uh, with reverence, frankly. And guy, you were one of them. And transition to the misty and how how'd your transition to the misty go it was pretty exciting from the outset it was good i i uh really really enjoyed it. i was very happy to be back in fighters and mm -hmm. the mission was excellent you know we had a really good mission fighting and interdicting convoys generally in root pack you know the the route the, the root pack really it was next to the dmz mm -hmm. the the one furthest away from Hanoi Haiphong on the south, you know, right up right. against South Vietnam. And our job was to try to interdict the convoys before they went across the passes. There were four passes into Laos. Our job was to try to interdict those convoys. And you would do that. You'd find the convoys. And then sort of what we did in the F-16 during the Coastal War, once you located a target, if you had ordnance, you'd expend on it. But generally, you would control other fighters to destroy the target and try to disrupt the supplies going into South Vietnam. Have I got that right? That's correct. We had our own tanker, each MISTI mission. Yep. Uh, we had a tanker airborne for the morning and for the afternoon. We had two missions in the morning, two missions in the afternoon. We hit the tanker twice over Laos, just across the border. Uh, so that, that gave us, you know, really five to five and a half hour missions, three penetrations into North Vietnam, about three and a half hours yep. there, uh, down low level. So it was a tremendous mission. It really was. So, viewers, that's three and a half hours walking down the most dangerous alley you can imagine in the most dangerous city in the world. Okay. Yeah, we and had we had repeated. heavy. We were under heavy fire. There was no doubt of that. We're we're down low, and uh, the the advantage of that was is that you knew that you were doing something every day that was contributing yeah. to uh, helping uh, fight the war, end the war. Uh, that was uh, my take over there. I wanted to help end the war to get back to my family uh, mm -hmm. as soon as possible. Uh, the other thing I had, I just uh, I mentioned quickly mm -hmm. because I really felt that uh, the reason I went over there was to show the communists that, you know, we had men that would fight them no matter what their ideas were. Their ideas were, I, you know, spent a lot on their philosophy was to tie us up in wars of liberation all over the world because we wouldn't fight. The U.S. wouldn't fight them. We weren't willing to fight that. They knew they couldn't beat us in a nuclear war, but they felt they could beat us, you know, country by country. And it was all S Stalin's idea that from, you know, back in 1920, that we'll take all the little countries and then all the resources will be in our hands. And then Europe and the United States will fall like ripe fruits off the trees into our hands because they cannot live without the resources of the little countries. And that's where wars of liberation came from in their whole philosophy and attacks. That's why it was all over the world. And these kinds of things. And Vietnam, one of the things it did was it stopped their wars of liberation because they had mm -hmm. to put all their effort into Vietnam. And that let us beat them everywhere else, honestly. It's interesting. Them cold. Yeah. Um, and you and I have talked a bit about Vietnam in the present day. We'll get back to that later. So, as you went over to oppose this war of liberation, and we know how unliberating those wars were for the affected populace, Guy, did you? Did you hate your enemy, these these North Vietnamese the, and Viet Cong that were shooting at you on a daily basis and trying to kill you, frankly? Did, no, not at all. How did you feel about the enemy? I was just like most Americans. You're just doing a job. You're, you're in a fight, and you're trying to do the job the best you can. There was really no uh, hatred at all in okay. combat. Yeah. And then, uh, and then uh, something you, an event you probably hated, you're early in your tour, you were shot down. Um, and yeah. rescued and badly injured. And folks, I'll tell you the book to read to learn about that. Um, at that point, could you have uh, called it a combat tour and going to work in a command post in, in uh, Saigon or something? What 
did you were you compelled to stay in the I, I didn't feel I didn't feel I mean I just wouldn't think of that you were allowed to not fly over North Vietnam after one shoot down okay, okay. So kind of rescue but I you know I didn't and some you know some people did that but I just couldn't imagine doing that so I just came back to Misty you know okay folks we have a lot of of uh, a lot of folks walking the streets who think they're badass Okay, you need to listen to guy's story and redefine the term. Uh, and I've thought about that a lot. You, you may think you're tough, but he was badly injured and fought his way back into combat. And yeah. that didn't work out so well because on your 12th Misty Sortie, I think, in the F-100, you were shot down again. Tell me about that. The sh what were you hit by in, in the moment of getting out of the airplane? Share a little of that moment, please, with the audience. Okay, we were hit. Uh, it was after a, a about five hours in the air. We'd attacked. Oof. It was under a fifteen hundred foot sailing. We were the only aircraft in North Vietnam. We went in without any ordnance on the wings, just with twenty millimeter cannon. And uh, the good thing about that was, is that we we could you know go down low under the low deck of fifteen hundred foot sailing. Mm -hmm. No, but of course the dive bombers couldn't do that. So the convoys were on the road in the daytime, and we knew that would happen. So. Uh, Craner and I went up there and we attacked and really tore up three convoys, expended all our ammunition uh, with 20 millimeter, you know, right out of the right out of the gunnery school type attacks, you know, right on the deck, uh, knocking those convoys. I, you know, every 20 millimeter was an exploding shell. So you're doing damage yep. every time you hit a truck and you're just going right down the line of the trucks. And at the what end, we're out of ammo. So we figured, well, we'll get a spot. We'll get a we'll get a fix on. a. There was a six six gun. Uh, batteries that was a very good position they'd almost got a number of the guys we've been putting in they almost got us a few times uh, and it was out in a rural area and it was a very good position it got the got the gunner the guy that ran that gun site was a really good commander mm -hmm. and so we trolled for fire and, and generally what we do when we had somebody like that we'd we'd get fire at the end of the day because otherwise they'd move the gun site they're very well camouflaged and then in the morning first thing in the morning we'd come in and hit them we'd hit the gun site uh you know they 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 mm -hmm. really frowned on that, but we did it all the time. And basically, we were, we we wanted to get their positions on a one to fifty thousand map that afternoon, right. the last thing. So we're trolling for fire about a half mile, a mile out from them, and we're being covered. You know, the tracers are all around us from, uh, you know, eighteen uh, fifty seven millimeter, eighteen thirty seven millimeter, hard balls, soft balls of fire. We're flying right through this cloud. Big bullets, One folks. Stops. One of them stops in the air and hit comes right into my canopy. And in fact, the last second I ducked my head and my thought was, is that uh, I've got to, if this thing explodes, that's it. My only hope is it's a dud because it was going to hit my canopy, but it mm -hmm. didn't. We moved forward and it hit behind me about four feet, which was a saddleback area, the 100, two hydraulic pumps, yawed the plane badly and flipped it over on its back and to the end of the ground from 1500 feet that we had to eject immediately. And, uh, had a stream and shoot, but I just had a, I had a seven and a half inch blade survival knife. And with the tip of the blade, I was able to cut a couple of risers, got a shoot, and then steer to a patch of woods. And that's a whole story in itself. Just Holy moly. Yeah. That's like, uh, that's several stories. Uh, yeah. And the end result, because we have something very important, you, you know what we want to get to guy. The end yeah. result is you wind up incarcerated in Thanwa prison in Hanoi, the, uh, the infamous Hanoi Hilton. We got a, a picture of it. it. Looks pretty benign. And Hanoi is a beautiful city today. I've been there many times. This is not a beautiful place. And very not beautiful things were happening there. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Let me take a quick breather and tell you that I'll be back in two weeks with another episode of Figments, the Power of Imagination. If uh, if CB is available, we'll try, probably talk on February 1st about Ford Air Control. It'll be a little more blind fight and um and i like it so hopefully the audience will too you've been respect receptive so far uh bef before i go on let me get to the reading list because if you want to know about the misties starting in the middle or at the top there furious upside down is a great uh book about the misty fact business and some very brave men doing very difficult work um, one of the prisoners who in the Hanoi Hilton was Robinson Reisner. His Passing of the Night was a very formative book for me as a young fighter pop. 
And then a book that is not at all about air combat, but is about combat and the morality and how and how humanity can be lost in combat is about the battles of Peleliu and Okinawa by E.B. Sledge with the old breed, uh, a, a book that I still pick up to be reminded of the nature of war. And your war took a turn, um, and that turn was to be incarcerated. One of the first things that happened was you wound up with an academy uh, colleague, I don't know if you're in the same class, but Lance Sijon, tell me, how did you reconnect with Lance in the Hanoi Hilton as a prisoner of war? Well, what happened was, is that it was really a holding camp down mm -hmm. uh, uh, east of the Magia Pass, and it was just a what they call a bamboo prison. It was just five, six little cells in there. Craner and I were in two of those cells. This was a temporary Craner, holding camp. Other pilot from the F-100 yeah. camp. A, a different camp. I was in six different camps in North Vietnam. There were 15 camps up there. This one was a temporary camp, the only one that was really a temporary camp. And mm -hmm. Craner and I were in there, and they brought this, this POW in in the middle of the night after we'd been there about a week or so. And uh, I saw him when I went by his cell. I pushed the door. We were in irons, you know, leg irons and uh, both hands and legs. Uh, and you could only shuffle along there. So taking me out to go to the bathroom, I guards in front, I pushed the cell in and I saw the skeleton on the floor. I thought it was a kid, it looked like a kid. And uh, the next day uh, I gave him a high sign, but he didn't respond uh, very well. And I, he was very, just like a skeleton. So uh, the next day they called us out of our, uh, the day of, that they brought him in in the middle of the night, they mm -hmm. called Craner and I up and he had a big cast on his left leg. And so they called us in to take him out and clean him up because he couldn't and um, you know take him to the bathroom so right. he put his arms around our shoulders and when he did he looked at me and he said aren't you guy gruders and i said i do a double take really and i said yes i am who are you and he said lance i said lance who he said Sai john lance Sai john i said oh no not Sai john Sai john was a class behind me at the academy but in my mm. in my squadron the 21st squadron for three years OK, oh my God. he played football. Unbelievable that he was in this kind of condition. I could pick him up in my arms. He's probably down to about 65 uh, pounds, you know, as an example. The yeah. hip bone was if you look at that picture from his academy days, you can see that, you know, he's a very robust, healthy, tip, kind of typical academy class guy. And we only have so much time. So I want to get to this, but get to the, the, the point that needs to be made. Right. You sure. Watched your captors kill your friend Lance Sanchez. Over yeah, time. they kill. They killed him because they they just basically uh, they beat him really badly. We're screaming like crazy. We're telling the interrogators he's all solo. And they're beating him on his wounds and so on. He wouldn't give him anything uh, but name, rank, service number, date of birth. And uh, to make a long story short, over the next you know three or four weeks, uh, he 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 died, and uh, it was uh, a helpless man, and it was just a, a terrible thing to and, witness you know and that's of, when you hated your enemy i you, that's where i started to hate the enemy now of course we were being tortured too and torture is a really bad thing and it uh, interrogation and torture and this is where you know you can't uh you just you can't imagine torture unless you're in it you know for uh long periods of time it's really bad and you can respond to that you can it, it in my case it, it resulted in uh hating uh seeing what they were doing uh, seeing their whole uh, philosophy which was you know you can't have your own opinions we're going to tell you our opinions and you better listen to them and we're going to use you for propaganda and all this kind of thing to really see what was happening you know keeping you so mm -hmm. with one of their pow all the things in a communist prison camp like living conditions, everything were just unbelievable. So it resulted it resulted in a really bad hatred, worse and worse. And over a period of months, I developed that hatred. First time in my life I ever developed hatred. And uh, as a result, it resulted in a terrible spiritual uh, crisis for me. And, and up, uh, to, yeah, up to that, I'll tell the audience, I know that you were a devout Catholic. Uh, we talked about that, but but, you know, that's kind of contrary to your nature, and it led you to such a dark place that you 
consider killing yourself? Yeah, well, what happened was is that, uh, of course, I, th I think that I'm fighting. I think that I'm fighting very well. I'm in a fight against yeah. these communists, and I'm doing everything I can, but I'm hating him. Now I'm hating him. First time I'm hating him, really hating him. And as a result of that, um, I started getting these, uh, just like it says, you, when you read about this stuff, you stop being able to sleep well. Uh, you're constantly mm -hmm. thinking about how you can get even, revenge, how you can torture them back, all this kind of thing. And so what happens is, is what happened to me was, I started, there, were, there was a number of men that quit eating and committed suicide, okay, throughout mm -hmm. the camps there. You know, a number of men that happened to mm -hmm. The conditions were horrible, and of course, you just thought it was, the conditions were terrible, and they just you couldn't take, take it anymore, which was a part of it, I'm sure. But anyway, the other thing that happened to me that was is that I had voices talking to me in my head, convincing mm -hmm. me that the only way to beat these guys completely was to stop eating. Now, they didn't say you're going to die. You know, the voices are not telling you that, you know, the devil's not telling you that this is going to kill you. But of course, you know that, right? Well, as soon as this happened and these voices kept being more and more insistent with all kinds of logical arguments like, look, there's no way that if they put you in the torture to meet the delegations or do this or whatever, there's no way you can resist that. You know that the people are going to break down after you know, a week or two you know that's mm -hmm. what's going on there's no way it's going to be different with you and basically you're going to have to do that you're going to be a traitor to the country a traitor to your family and so on right so that's the kind of things these voices would tell you so when, when, when they started talking about not eating then i knew that it was the devil and i'm you know i literally am thinking things like lord why why is the devil talking to me i'm fighting as best i can i want to beat these communists you know and stuff like that why is this happening you know and so on but there's 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 dead silence, right? So these things get more and more insistent. And then luckily, I and I had had good training. I had a little nun mm -hmm. teach me in the seventh or eighth grade that you know you never want to commit suicide. I knew I couldn't commit suicide because she told me you never commit suicide because that's a mark of a quitter and a coward. But the thing that mm -hmm. thing that I always remember, she says, but worse than that, it's not just you're a quitter and a coward forever, but you're making your family the quitter family, the coward family. Everybody you're yeah. associated with, your parents, your so brothers, nun's sisters, voice, your relatives. Oh, she was dynamite. The, I still remember. The nun's voice Thomas replaced Anne. the devil's voice. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a, she. That's what I remembered was, yeah. gee, you can't commit suicide. You're gonna wow. have a quitter family, you know. So anyway, basically, wow. I said, okay, well, you know, that's that's. Then I realized it because my I really believe because my wife and my aunt, and my mother were praying hard. They were going to daily mass rosaries and everything like that mm -hmm. because of that i had i was blind to the hate but then i saw you know why is this happening i realized because of the hate oh the hate the hate the hate yeah. that's right hate is a sin i'm not allowed to hate i've never hated like this before you know i commit other sin but i never hated like this this was really a bad sin you know really bad so i felt like well all right i can't i can't i can't you know commit suicide so i gotta beat this hate so I tried to beat the head of hate on my own for the first week or two. I could not stop the voices. It got worse. I couldn't beat the hate on my own. Mm. So I got on my knees and I started praying literally like, you know, you hear people talking about, I said, Jesus, Jesus, you know, you got to help me. I can't beat this guy. You know, you got to help me beat him, you know, and so on. And I, I had forgotten, I, I had been going to mass, but I had I forgotten, like as an example, part of the rosary and so on. I didn't even know the mysteries, but I knew it was 50 Hail Marys with our fathers every 10. And I just started saying that and other prayers out of my mind, asking Jesus to please help me to beat this ridiculous voices that are talking to me. And after three and months, I, yeah, and after three months, I remember being ecstatic because I, for the first time, for the first time in many, many months, I could say, Lord, forgive him. And it was just, it wasn't out loud. It was just in my mind. And I didn't mean it. It was a lie. But it was the first time that I could even form those words in my mind. And so I knew that somehow God was changing my heart. Three months later, I really was praying for all these 22 different torturers and interrogators that mm -hmm. I'd had experience with to be forgiven and to get to heaven. And I meant it. I was really praying for all of them to get to heaven. And that that's where I first came to realize that the whole world is God's children and his masterpieces. And we're not supposed to hate anybody, period, you know. Yeah, and that is the bottom line I wanted to get to is where I, I believe that. As I 
blue combat sorties over the beautiful Balkans and looked at the ugliness that hatred created there, I told myself, in a different, easier circumstances, I'm just not going to hate anymore. Because look what it does. Look, okay. look what it does. So to me, Guy, and again, not to put words in your in your mouth because you're so eloquent about this, but it's like you got freed twice. You were freed from the hatred. And then uh, about 50 years ago, this coming March 14th, you were freed from imprisonment in Vietnam. And we got a picture of another group of POWs. How did it, we're running over time? Absolutely no surprise with such important things to discuss. But the moment that you lifted up from Hanoi, how did that? Can you describe we, the feeling? We honestly couldn't believe it when we mm -hmm. got out of there. We couldn't yeah. believe it. It was such a complete, for five years, we knew that we were never going to get out of there. You know, we we're going to die yeah. up there. Then the B 52s started that bombing and that. That did it. That got us out. Changed there. everything, and that's yeah. that's yet another show. I mean, you may be the, the I may ask you to be a guest several times, and this it had to feel real here, where you're actually greeted by your family, and that's a picture of you as a captain upon yeah. relief. Um, I want to ask you to tell what that feels like, but to spend five years, three months in prison, tortured, going through the anguish and the depths of hatred, and coming out to your family that stayed with you and waited for you. Um, wow, God bless you, guy. It's an amazing story. God bless you. Thank you. And, and I just say that you, your story got more amazing. Uh, you and your wife had five more kids. You flew for an airline. You had a software company. Still do, Matt. I think you said you still do. Yeah, that's uh, true. You've d done amazing things as an individual, an entrepreneur, a motivational speaker. So let me ask you this. Would any of that been possible had you continued to hate? No, I'm sure he would have talked me into suicide. Yeah. I'm sure he would have talked me into suicide. He's smart. He's yeah, smart. Was... If I hadn't had that training, you know, and if I hadn't had the prayer for me and so on, and we had a lot of Americans praying for us, it, because the whole, the whole thing that's hard for people to understand is despite the sin, I didn't see it as I'm in the sin. Mm -hmm. Okay, I had the grace from the prayers I believe of my family to see the fact that hatred was a sin. I thought it was just part of the fight. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, wow, powerful testimony, and uh, much needed in times like these where there's just too darn much hate. We all have. <laughs> we all have anger. Things make me mad. Sometimes I express it more pithily. If that was a play <laughs> on words. Um, but there's a different a difference between anger and hate, and the fact that we somehow are compelled these days to hate people who think, act, look, whatever differently is dangerous for our society. And I pray that yeah. we'll find a better way because the world deserves a better way, and our kids and grandkids and whatever generation of any of the eight million miracle, eight billion miracles, as you put it, uh, deserve that. Guy, I'm a I see again, insist that you come back with CB and talk for your control and more stuff. I am so fortunate to have met you. I thank you for the time today. Yes, audience, we ran over, but but it was worth it. So, Guy, we'll aloha. Think about you. Aloha. All right. hey. Let me uh, sign off with our folks here. Remind you that we do have uh, QR codes here. I'll show them on the screen so you can quick get a quick look at the playlists on YouTube. We're also available on Vimeo, Spotify, and other. Um, platforms. By the way, you got two pretty tech savvy old guys here, so don't think you're the only ones who know know the tech world. And and finally, I want to thank Think Tech Hawaii, a wonderful uh, nonprofit corporation that enables citizen journalists like me with their Think Tech uh, videos. Eric and Ash, my engineers, special thanks to you, and uh, I look forward to talking with you in two weeks. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo.
You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.